Okay. Great to see so many of you here. Um, we always get a lot of interest in this webinar and I absolutely understand why it's, you know, we're just talking about the public high school admissions process today and it is so confusing. Um, we used to try to do this webinar public and private and maybe we could go to that format in the future, but we, I think we need two hours at least. So for now, um, we're just going to do the public high school admissions process. When I, when I, um, uh, started talking about this webinar um, in our, you know, just to our to our clients and in um, on our social and things like that. I was saying, did you know that there are four high school admissions processes now that are just public, and that's including, you know, that's including the private schools. So that kind of, blew, sorry, not including. That's including the charter schools. So that sort of blew my mind. <laughs> Um, and I think people are feeling that, that it's, you know, it's just a lot. Thankfully, we have Katie here, who is um, an admissions consultant just working in the New York City uh, public school system. Um, and we'll start by doing some quick introductions as more people file in here. We don't want to take, you know, too much time with this because we want to get to the meat here, but want to hear all about you, Katie. Welcome, welcome. So hi, everyone. Thank you for taking time on this Wednesday evening. I'm excited because I'm looking out my window and it's actually still sunny out, even though it is 630, which um, brings me joy. We're getting into spring. Um, so I am someone who focuses pretty much ex exclusively on the public school system. I have a lot of clients who are also applying to independent schools. But what I try and do is I help families navigate this process with um information and with a minimal amount of stress. That's my, my entire goal in working with families. I've been working with families for a number of years now. I really love seeing the families start with this kind of uh, absence of information. They come to me and they're sort of a blank slate and we build a list together and they go through this process feeling really calm and secure and with great results. So that's something that I love helping families with. And it's one of the reasons why I started Catherine Miller Consulting. Awesome, Back thank you. Me. And I'm, yeah, um, I'm Lisa. Um, I started Ivy Tutors Network 19 years ago, hard to believe, but yes, it's we're in our 19th school year. Um, we're also really New York City specialists. We work with some students on things like SAT and ACT, more of the um, you know, national uh, tests uh, all over the country, but really for 19 years, we've been working in New York and the entire time working with kids on high school admissions and specifically the SHSAT, the IC test, the SSAT tax for, for um, Catholic schools, et cetera. So um, we, um, you know, I went to Bronx Science um, and then Columbia University, as you see there. And, you know, I've always uh, wanted uh, to have a company that does things a little bit differently. So we really focus on mentoring relationships. We focus on personalizing curriculum for each student. So our test prep is really data driven um, and we will personalize the curriculum based on how kids are performing in the test and how quickly they're learning which which concepts and that's something that varies greatly among students especially in this pandemic world where um, people have just you know um, have had different levels of um, of, of learning and um, were able to retain different things in, a, in, in the during pandemic school right so um, the other thing that we do differently is we, we offer a semi-private program, which is also a personalized program for three to six kids where those kids are able to share the price of an individual tutor, but we'll get to some of that later. Um, and Katie and I will be available for um, questions at the end as well. So I'll take you really quickly through the agenda. Um, we're gonna talk about all the, all the school options. I talked about how they were, you could actually potentially get, you know, uh, you know, um, get into four different schools and have that option, right? <laughs> this is very, this is qu quite different, you know, slightly different and uh, from, from when I was applying um, uh, a long time ago. Um, we're gonna talk about what the process is and how it's changing as much as we have um, insight into, into that right now with there's a new administration and we have some thoughts on that. Um, 
a really important topic, finding the right schools for you. There are so many incredible schools in New York, and we'll talk about how to learn about them and how to find the right schools for your, for your family and your child. Um, we'll take you through a bit of the timeline and what you can do now to prepare, because if, um, if you have a seventh grader, especially, um, it's, it's, it, this is really the time to, uh, to start this process if you haven't already. And there are even things you can do if you have a younger, younger child especially you know I think if you're here now and you're learning about this and you have a sixth grader or fifth grader you're already um uh you know doing something really wonderful for your family I, I truly think that knowledge is power right um and uh we'll talk about the SHSAT at the end all right so I'll um I'll let Katie to talk us through these school options all right, so as, as Lisa alluded to earlier, we're gonna focus primarily on the public schools. We'll touch briefly in this slide on the different options because while Lisa is correct that we could get as you know, four, we could get even more offers than four um, because New York City likes to make things a little bit complicated. So let's start with the general education schools. And I'm gonna to speak to process in the next slide and as we move forward. So I'm just gonna to touch on these now. The general education schools, the easiest way to think about them is they are the public schools that are not specialized. And I'll explain a little bit more about that later. There are a number of categories of general education schools. But what it means when I say general education is that you're not taking the SHSET for entrance into these schools and you're not LaGuardia. All of the other public high schools are considered to be general education schools, but they fall into four broad categories. One of those is screened schools. And screens just means that they look at something, whether that's grades or state test scores, or in the past it was um, absences and tardies, uh, whether it might involve writing an essay or taking an assessment. It can mean a number of different things. Um, so when you hear someone talk about the screened general education schools, that's what they mean. In addition, there are audition schools, which is really kind of a subcategory of screened. And the audition schools are also considered to be general education schools, with the exception of LaGuardia. Like I said, New York City likes to make things a little bit complicated. So all of the other audition schools in the performing arts or the visual arts are also considered to be general education schools. So that would be a school like Frank Sinatra, Brooklyn High School of the Arts, and a number of other strong programs. Finally, we have the educational options schools, which are schools which attempt to create an academically heterogeneous environment within their schools by taking one third high achieving, one third mid achieving and one third low achieving. And they, they determine that based on your child's grades and they essentially use a lottery to decide who's gonna get those seats. Finally, we have the simplest, which is the open schools. And that just means that your child, whether or not your child gets a seat in this school is determined by a lottery. And we're gonna speak a little bit more about this now fabled lottery later. The second category of schools we're gonna talk about today are the specialized schools. Now we're gonna divide it into two categories as Lisa did here. We have the eight schools that require you to sit the, the specialized high school test. That's the SHSAT, the Shazat, the kids have a meaner word for it, but let's just, for, for lack of a better word, we'll call it the SHSAT for now. So those schools just look at your child's SHSAT scores. And those schools include schools like Stuyvesant, Bronx Science, Brooklyn Tech, Lehman, Brooklyn Latin, High School for Math, Science and Engineering, Queen Science, and Staten Island Tech. Our third category we're gonna talk about is that special ninth specialized school, that's LaGuardia. So LaGuardia is also an audition school, but it is a separate category than the other two. And I'll, so when you look at those three, the general education schools, the specialized SHSAT schools, and the specialized LaGuardia school, the reason we're separating them out into three separate categories is you can get an offer to a general education school an offer to an SHSAT school 
and an offer to one or more of the programs at Laboria. And you can get all of those offers and then you have about 30 days to choose among them. So what we want going into this process, and we're gonna speak more to this later, we want to keep as many doors open as possible. So that's so that we, we have an option to have these many offers in case the general education offer doesn't work for us or the specialized offer doesn't work. Um, finally, we have our two other categories, which really arguably could even be three. We have our charter schools, which operate totally separately from the public schools. You can enter into a lottery for the, lottery for the charter schools and get a seat there. In addition to all your public school seats and private school seats, they, they are completely, completely separate processes. And finally, our independent or private schools and our parochial schools. Um, all of which kind of work on that sort of September to February, March kind of calendar the same way the public schools do, but work very, very differently. They have different admissions tests and they have different demands on students who are applying to them. Uh, right. I think I covered the school options. <laughs> oh, you, you absolutely did. And I just want to take, take a moment to say, you know, how lucky New York City's students are to have all these options. Um, I think that there's a, you know, I, I, I started by speaking about how confusing this process can be and how um, it can feel scary and there's a, an element of chance, which is always hard for people to, um, it's always hard for, for people to swallow, including myself, right, who likes to <laughs> not know the outcomes of things, but um, how cool that there, you know, there, we have so many wonderful schools to choose from and um, and the opportunity for uh, nine different specialized schools plus charter schools. And um, it's it's really an exciting process to start um, in, in, in middle school to look at where you wanna do your, do your, do your high school, right? And, and um, pick a couple of different options that you're excited about. All right. Should we dive right into process? I, I, think we, I, think, paper? I think we need to. I think we need to. Oh, I, I did want to say one other thing about um, the private school process. You know, these past couple of years, um, the timing has been off. And we're hoping that the timing is going to be more in sync with the public school process going forward when, you know, when all these, these COVID things are, are over and knock on all the woods, right? <laughs> um, because, uh, for example, our our current seventh graders have heard back. All, sorry, our current eighth graders have heard back already about where they're going. You know where they've been accepted for private school, and um, you know they're being um, you know asked to uh, maybe even um, you know give some, you know start paying or you know sign the sign that they're sign that they're going or not um but we haven't heard back yet and we're expecting to hopefully hear back in april about um the specialized schools so there's a there's you know there's um unfortunately a, a little bit of a miss there but usually the processes like katie was saying are more more aligned that, that's true, Lisa. And actually, I mean, we can we can get into this a little more later when we're talking about the timeline. Um, but one thing to think about, you know, a lot of families will hedge their bets if they can, if they're not sure about, you know, the outcome of the public schools, they might apply to one or two independent schools or parochial schools or charter schools or just some way to sort of broaden those options. And that's yeah. where so if wide net right yeah. yeah so if parochial schools are in the realm of possibility for your families and they will not be for all families um they're an interesting option to think about for a couple of reasons one is they cost less money mm -hmm. number two is they have a lot of merit aid number three is while they tell you even earlier than the independent schools the deposits that they ask for are infinitely more reasonable than those asked by the independent schools. So when you're thinking about how you want to broaden your portfolio of schools, 
if you were thinking, oh, I don't know, maybe parochial schools, those are the reasons to start to think about that. And you can talk to Lisa or someone from, from Ivy about the different tests that they have and how to prepare for them. They're, they're well-versed in all of these different kinds of tests. I'm not gonna go into all the acronyms now, but I just wanted to kind of plant that idea that if this was in the back of your head that this is something you might wanna consider, it's worth kind of exploring now so that you have a plan for test prep. Back to, did I miss something on that, Lisa? Or should I go back to public school? <laughs> go back and definitely, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, I was just exactly, exactly what you said. I was thinking about all the, the, the students that have had to give deposits already and um, for private school, even though they haven't heard from the, about the, the SHSAT. So that's just something to keep in mind. But yes, let's talk, let's back to public high school admissions process. What is the process? So the first thing you need to know about the public high school process is this portal called My Schools. Now you've probably heard about that already. People use it for middle school admissions. You may have used it already. In order to use the My Schools portal, you need, or to, to apply to schools through the My Schools portal, you need your OSIS code, which is your student identification code. All public school families have that. Private school families need to get that from the Family Welcome Center at some point. It's basically like your school social security number and it will <laughs> follow your child all the way through public school. You also need what's called a My Schools activation code. Now you can't get that until September, but you can still use the My Schools portal before then to explore schools and read about them. And the reason I'm spending so much time on my schools is that the DOE in the last couple of years has used it for almost all aspects of the public school process, even more so this year. So mm -hmm. it's where the big directory lives. For those of you who have older children, you may remember this book that was basically a doorstop. Um, it weighed a thousand pounds and killed a thousand trees, but it had all the different descriptions of schools in it. Now all those descriptions live on my schools and they're all electronic. So it's where that lives. It's also where you apply to your general education schools. It's where you upload materials. If schools are asking for additional materials, it's where you register for the SHSAT and for your LaGuardia edition and a number of other things that happen on that portal. So be familiar with my schools important. My schools sounds like my student, which is where grades and state test scores live. It is not the same. It's just sounds a lot like it. <laughs> different portals, different DOE things, similar names. Like I said, again, the New York City likes to keep things a little bit complicated. Keep you on your toes. Exactly. So <laughs> in terms of the general education schools, as I said earlier, it's all the public school options with the exception of the nine specialized schools. At some point in the fall, you will list 12 general education schools on your child's application and you will rank them in true order of preference. This is probably the thing I say the most times. And if you work with me, you'll hear it lots and lots of times. And I'll mostly say it with a smile, but rank in true order of preference. We are so used to as New Yorkers thinking that there's got to be a way around the system. There has to be a way to game it. There is not in this case. The DOE genuinely cares which is your first choice and which is your last choice. And they will try to match your child to the highest ranked school on your list. If you don't get into your first choice school, they treat your second choice like your first and so on. So when you hear people say, and I guarantee you will, don't put that school first, you're wasting your first choice. That is incorrect. You can send them to me and I promise to correct them. In terms of evaluating admissions potential, that's a piece that's really a moving target. We don't know what schools are gonna look at, what they're gonna be allowed to look at, more on that later. But in the past, as we've said, they have looked at grades, they have looked at state test scores, whether or not your child has an IEP um, or is entitled to special education services, um, that part's a little complicated. That also determines how they will be treated through admissions. It's actually an advantage in a lot of ways because around 22% of seats at all public high schools are put aside for students who are entitled, um, for students who have an IEP that mandates more than 20% of special education services. So if you're not sure if that's your child or not, talk to your guidance counselor. In Great addition, time. 
Schools look at whether your student is entitled to free or reduced price lunch. Um, many, 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 if not most of the schools will now have a carve out for students entitled to free or reduced price lunch. This is called the DIA carve out. So that's more or less what schools are looking at when they admit your child. You rank as many schools as you can on the application, but you don't list a school you wouldn't send your child to. More on that later. Be realistic. There are lots of good schools out there, but there's a lot of competition for them. So keep your list as broad as you can and be sure to include schools that have fewer applicants per seat. As I mentioned earlier, in March-ish, um, hopefully of eighth grade, your child will get one offer to the general education schools. And if your child is not admitted to any of those 12 schools, they will be assigned to a school. In addition, we have the waitlist process, which is ever evolving, but seems to have more or less stabilized into the following. You, your child will be automatically put on a wait list for any school ranked above the school where they are placed. Automatic, you don't have to do anything. Then you get to know your wait list number. So you get to track that in real time. It does not mean that being on a wait list is any kind of a guarantee that you're gonna get a seat at those schools. The wait lists don't move very much, but it's a much more transparent process than it used to be. Mm -hmm. Moving on to the specialized high schools, unless Lisa, you think I, I there's any questions about the general education. Well, we always get questions from parents about, um, well, you know, whether that happens. Do people not get one of their 12 choices? Because 12 seems like a lot, right? Um, and, um, you know, unfortunately it does happen, right? Hence that, that, that so, wait list process yeah. and, and us get, giving you this recommendation to really cast a wide net and um, think about the other processes and the other the other applications you can you can there, do. You know, that's that's a really good point, Lisa. There there are there are many ways to minimize the possibility of a negative outcome, and we're going to talk about that today because thinking about those from the beginning is really the key to having a successful outcome. But a lot of it totally is about agree. mindset. It's about not going in thinking these are the only good schools. It's about really being creative about schools that will be a strong fit for your child. That's where I really, you know, focus on with the families that I work with, focusing on fit. Let's not think about how to get into these schools or what the top 10 schools are. Think about schools that are going to give your child that kind of secret sauce, that thing that's going to build them into the sort of student that's exciting to colleges. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, but yes, to sort of answer your question, quite frankly, there are students who don't get matched. A lot of times it's because they aimed a little too high and they didn't put safety schools down. Sometimes it's a matter of just very bad luck, but that is very unusual. If you have mm -hmm. a balanced list and you're thoughtful about constructing it, it is quite uncommon to not get matched to any of your 12 schools. So Great. That makes our specialized high school system seem really simple, right, Lisa? <laughs> I know. All, all so that happens. True. So here, here's the fun. I'm gonna, I can tell you this one in a couple of bullets. For the eight SHSAT-based specialized schools, they look at your SHSAT score. That's it. You can take it one time in ninth grade and one time in eighth grade, should you want to. But you, so you can't take it again. There's no wait list for the specialized schools. Or hopefully in the opposite order. Yes, <laughs> One exactly. time in eighth grade, you order. can try again in ninth grade. Yeah. <laughs> Going backwards in time now. But yeah. they look at the score and they try and match your child to the highest ranked school on your list based on their test score. Now, the cutoff scores change year to year for schools, but they more or less stay the same in relation to each other. Stuyvesant is almost always the highest, has the highest cutoff, and Brooklyn Latin right. almost always has the lowest cutoff. They can shift. It's, it's all based on who wants to go to these schools and what they're scoring on these tests, but I will say those have pretty much stayed the same for a lot of years. Yep. Yeah, when yeah. you apply for the specialized schools, it's also pretty simple. Sometime in the fall, you register for the SHSAT. At that point, you rank the SHSAT schools that you're interested in, in true order of preference. And again, I'm going to say, if you love Stuyvesant, put it first. There's no harm. Just know that if you don't love Stuyvesant and you put it first and your child scores really well, 
they may end up at style sale because again, they're going to look at what you chose as your first, second, third, fourth choice and match your child to the, the highest ranked school they can based on their take test score and based right. on their- So there's no changing your mind. Nope. Yeah, whatever you put on, you know, on the day of that test is, is what it is, yep. And I do, I get this question a lot, like what if, what if you get a score that would allow you to say, get into Stuyvesant and you then say, oh, but I want to go to Stuyvesant. It doesn't work that way. If you put Brooklyn Tech first and you score well enough to get to Stuyvesant, guess what? You're going to Brooklyn Tech because that's the school you chose first. Um, we are going to answer a lot of questions at the end. Um, but I just wanted to quickly answer this one. So yes, the, the specialized high schools are in a completely separate bucket from the general education schools. Right. Those eight schools plus LaGuardia do not get entered into your list of 12. That's how right. you can get multiple offers. One and that's why we were saying what a unique process it is that you can potentially get four or more offers to go to public high school because you can get an offer from your list of 12 and then also get an offer from your list of eight schools that are the ones um, that take the SHSAT exam or the SHAT exam. Um, so that's that's two. That could be two of your four offers. Um, yeah, uh, you know, um, I think this concept of this test being so rigid and being the sole criterion for, for entry into these eight schools for, for, for people who didn't grow up in New York, for parents who didn't grow up in New York is kind of mind blowing. Like, wait a second, they never get to see my, my child's grades or their attendance record or there's no essay option or I can't, oh wait, actually we don't want to go to Stuyvesant. We now are thinking Brooklyn Latin would be better because of the commute. We can't change that later. No, this is a very, very rigid process. And in some ways kind of, but, you know, of course it's got its, its, its faults, but it, it's trying to be a real meritocracy. Right. It's trying to say this is it's 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 only merit based on this one test. Um, but of course, that has its flaws, too, because you can have you can, you know, have a headache the day of the test. Or just have, you know, be having a bad day. True, which is why, Lisa, both you and I suggest that as you're preparing for the SHSAT, you aim for 50 points above the cutoff of the school you like the most. 100%. So that you can have those headache points. So that if you have a headache, love you it. Can headache score points. 50 points lower and still, still get getting in. Um, I see a question in the chat and guys, I promise you we're going to have a Q and A at the end. It's just, sometimes I see yeah. the questions as I'm talking, sometimes I don't. So if I miss your question, please put it in at the end, but no, that's why I'm continuing to say the eight SHSAT based specialized schools, which are separate from LaGuardia. LaGuardia does not look at the SHSAT. LaGuardia right. only looks at your child's audition. So that's a good segue for me to talk a little bit briefly about LaGuardia. So again, it is based on so that's, the third, that's the third or maybe or even fourth or fifth or sixth or seventh. Right. Some of that's our kids the next really offer talented, that you right? can get. So you're, you're racking them up now. You're going to yeah. get into one of your 12. You're going to work really, really hard for the SHSAT and get into one of those schools. And then maybe you have a talent and that's going to be your other offer. Yes. Different yes. application process. Exactly. So for LaGuardia, all you do is you register for an audition again on that My Schools portal. For the last couple of years, these auditions have been virtual. Not sure how that's going to work in the fall. They may continue to offer them as an option for families, but I think that schools really do like seeing kids come in in person. So I wouldn't be surprised if it returned to that format. Yeah. Uh, again, that's what no I would think. SHSAT score, just the audition. And they also don't look at grades. The only thing they have is a floor. So you need to have above a 75 GPA. This year it was like, you need to be in groups one, two or three, I think it was. You need to be above a 75% GPA in order to be eligible to audition for LaGuardia. So that's, that's more or less how it works. So having great grades, having not so great grades, doesn't help you or hurt you in the LaGuardia process. It's based on pure talent. Mm -hmm. And you can apply to up to six programs at LaGuardia. And if your child is crazy talented, they can apply to all of them. Dance, drama, fine arts or visual arts, instrumental music, technical theater, and vocal music. And you can get an offer from all of them. And at that point, you'll have your LaGuardia offers, your SHSAT offer maybe, and a gen ed offer. And then you can choose 
which of those you want to say yes to. Yeah. Yeah. And we definitely see kids getting in for multiple majors at LaGuardia every year. So that's absolutely in the realm of possibility, especially for things like maybe, maybe singing or an instrument. And then if somebody's also has an interest in stage tech, you know, um, yeah. quite different. And it, another thing to bear in mind, and we're going to speak a little bit more about this later, when you're crafting your general education list, let's say your child is on the fence about LaGuardia, or maybe you are, maybe you just don't think it's the right fit for your child, mm. but they're a talented singer or they're a talented uh, painter or something or dancer. There are many, many schools within the general education bucket, that list of one through 12, that also use additions. And at least in the last several years, these additions have been the same. I'm curious how that's going to work if they go back to live auditions. Hmm. When they were video auditions, you would, you would submit the same audition to LaGuardia as you did to Frank Sinatra, et cetera, et cetera. I, I'd love to see them maintain some of that efficiency as we move back into a live model. I don't know how they're going to do that. Um, I hope they come up with something creative and good. But if you have a child who's strong in the arts, it's a great way to diversify that general education list. And again, minimize that possibility of a negative outcome. So I think we talked enough about the independent and the charter and the parochial schools for now, just because you want to get to those questions at the end. Um, is there anything else you wanted me to mention about process, Lisa? Um, no, I think I think we're good for now. Um, and you know, uh, I do want to say that I, I'm seeing some questions also come in in the chat. Um, you can ask questions in the chat or in the Q and A. I'm seeing some people raise their hand, um, press the little hand icon. Probably better for us since we have so much to get through. If you could, if, instead of raising your hand, if you can just put your question in the Q and A, we'll we'll be sure to answer it. Okay. So um, the next thing we want to talk about is. Um, you know how the high, how the high school admissions process has changed because some people, you know, have more than one child. It's quite quite common, <laughs> and maybe they have a child who went through this process a few years ago, and and it's it's surprising how things have changed even since then, right? Or or me, for example, I went through the process many years ago, and and I would need a you know a refresh a, a here. So let's we could kind of whiz through this a little bit. Uh, Lisa, do you want me to do it? Yeah, that would be great. Okay. Um, so one of my favorite slash least favorite words to use, and you'll hear it a lot from me, is historically, um, just because that's what we're doing. When we're talking about what we think it's going to be like in the fall, we are looking at sort of historical historical evidence of how it's worked in the past three years. And I will say, having observed over the past sort of five years even, there have been big, big changes almost every year. So what we're seeing that are more trends rather than one-off changes are number one, a loss of autonomy in the schools. And what I mean by that is in the past, individual schools would have individual rubrics and they would assess how they would accept students. So maybe Beacon or Bard or Millennium or Baruch or, um, or some of the big, big, big schools in Brooklyn like Midwood or Morrow, they would have different they would have different specific rubrics on how they would admit students. And what happened this year was a continuation of what's already been happening. So DOA said, no, 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 no. We're, we're going to rank the students. So like you're going to, parents are gonna rank what they want one through 12. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna have this information about each student and it's gonna be the same for every student. So it's gonna be this kind of grades or, this kind of state test scores or whatever it is. And we're gonna have it all be the same. And then once we have your choice and we've looked at the grades, we run our algorithm. Now I'm dumbing it down a little bit because it is definitely more complicated than that. But essentially they took it out of the hands of the schools and said, we're gonna handle this now. In some ways, that's a good thing. It sort of leaves out the possibility for there to be any kind of creating favors or other things that could possibly happen. On the other hand, schools are not ubiquitous. They're different from each other. They have different needs. They have different kinds of students. And 
it takes away from the ability of a school to sort of define its personality. Now we saw a little bit of a step back from that this year because all of a sudden they decided to allow schools like Beacon and Bard in Eastside Community and School of the Future and NEST plus M and a few others to say, you know what, we actually want students to write something and we're gonna assess what they wrote and we're gonna then tell you the score that they got on those essays and you're going to take that information and rank the students so they kind of clawed a little bit back of that autonomy but i will say there is definitely a general trend away from giving that power to the schools there's also a general movement away from screening what we saw this year is we saw a giant bucket of students that had essentially between an 80 and a 100 in their gpa and they were all treated the same Hmm. That number of the students between 80 and 100, you can, people will quote different percentages, but I have heard that that was 77% of the student body in New York City. So, right. And also such a huge range, like right? a, a B minus, a very low B minus to an A plus student. That's a completely different student. It was way too big a bucket to be really discerning. And so, because you always had more more students in that bucket than seats at this very competitive schools, they use each individual student's lottery number, you only get one lottery number for all of the schools to determine who would get a seat. Now that's how it did, how it worked this year. We right. are definitely seeing, like with all the conversations around equity, which are really important to have, we are seeing this movement away from like really iterative screening, meaning the kids who are got the 100 are ranked first and so on down the list. But I don't know for sure that it's going to be as extreme a movement away from screening with this administration as it was this year. There are a lot of elements that came into play. We had the pandemic still kicking around. So a lot of schools and the DOE felt that grades were not as predictive as in past years. Um, it just didn't seem fair to really hold a student to a specific grade and say, this is, this is what will predict whether you'd be successful at this high school. So I think that we are going to see some shifting and changing, but there is a general movement away from that sort of tight screening that allowed a student who was a 98 or a 99 average to pretty much walk their way into one of the top schools. Mm -hmm. Now, just again, just to kind of reorient us for a second, I'm talking about the general education process. The SHSAT process for right now is staying exactly the same as it has. So still screened, still top score gets to choose first. That's how it still works, which is another reason why you kind of want to keep that in your arsenal if possible. The other things that have changed are the kinds of screening, and I alluded to this earlier, you'll hear terms like batch ranking. Again, that's sort of that thing I call a bucket where students around with the same kind of bracket of grades are treated the same. Those are just different kinds of screening. Other things that have shifted that are really important to focus on are that the district priorities are no more. Now it's been a couple of years of that, so it shouldn't be exciting brand new news to anybody, but all those schools that were super exciting to everyone in district two, like Eleanor Roosevelt, Baruch, Lab, et cetera, now are open to every student in New York City, not just every student in Manhattan, but every student in New York City. Now we were supposed to also get rid of the borough priorities, meaning if you go to school in Brooklyn, you get first crack at a school in Brooklyn and vice versa. But in the very last minute, we brought uh, de, de Blasio brought that back in. So all of a sudden we did have borough priorities again for some schools. Manhattanites, apologies, Manhattan doesn't really believe in Manhattan priorities. So while, Brooklyn families and Queens families will have schools where they will get priority entrance because of where they live. There are only very, very few amount of schools in Manhattan that do the same thing. Now, will the borough priority go away again this fall? Maybe it was supposed to, I think it might. Um, mm -hmm. I think that what will happen if I had to guess is we will remove the borough priority, but we will maintain the very, very few schools that still use zones. Again, not a thing in Manhattan, 
but is still a thing in some parts of Queens and Brooklyn. Right. Um, you, you mentioned um, the, the lottery number. Um, so we mentioned lottery twice. They're very different. We talked about the charter school lottery, which is, you know, you just, if there's a charter school that you like in your area or somewhere that you've heard is great, you visit it, et cetera. Um, that's a, that's a, that's a lottery in it's kind of true sense where you apply and it, it, it's, a, it's a lot, uh, you know, the, the number of app, the number of seats they have, they draw a lottery for each of those seats. Um, now there's this other thing, which is the lottery number that is randomly, uh, the number that is randomly assigned to you when you're, when you're doing that general education one through 12 process, right? And how does that, let's, let's talk just for a second about how that affects the, um, the ranking. So it doesn't affect the rank. <laughs> like, right, sorry. But, yes, so how it affects, affects whether it you're going to get into your rank school. It should not affect how you rank the schools. But what, what's happened this year, so if we combine the movement away from screening with the loss of autonomy of schools, and the district borough changes. And I'm just gonna quickly mention this because this is the other piece. Oh, yes, it's yes. increase in the diversity and admission carve outs. So, you know, if 70% of the seats are held at a school for students entitled to pre-reduced price lunch, then there's really only 30% of the seats um, for students who are not entitled to free or reduced price lunch. So we're talking about a sort of compression of seats yep. and a, a broader batch of students. So where that happens, the lottery number, the luck aspect becomes much more powerful. So each student is assigned a lottery number. This year, the DOE told the families what their lottery number was. Now, someone who is a statistician and quite smart, I'm very impressed by her article actually, um, decoded this massively long alphanumeric sequence and essentially figured out that it's the first two letters or numbers that determine what percentage of students have a better lottery number than you, which in turn tells you your odds of getting into a school, but only kind of, sort of. That's the hard thing with the lottery number because what it doesn't tell you is how many students are applying to these schools and are those students in the same batch as you and do they have priority or maybe not? And mm -hmm. it doesn't take into account human choice. It does, however, really mess with your mind. Um, right. So it's almost I, like I'd rather not know because there's not anything I can do about it anyway. So I know my number. What I still, I I still need to, as to your point, exactly. rank but schools I, in their true order, in the true order of priority. You know, if they nothing were to changes. Tell you, like the weird thing is, they told families the lottery number so late in the process that there was nothing they could do at that point. It was like, right. oh, well, that's a terrible number. I guess I wish I had done X, Y, or Z. Um, sort of intentional, if they continue it, to use this lottery number and they continue to be transparent about it, I'll be curious to see if they perhaps give families that lottery number earlier. A little because earlier, here's what yeah. it might do. If you are in the top 5%, I'm even gonna give you top 8%, or you're in the bottom, let's say 20%, that information, that data is going to impact how you approach this process. It has to, because at that point, if you don't listen to it, you're putting your head in the sand. So if you're in the top 5%, you can exhale a little bit. It means that you have a little more room to play with the schools. If you are in the bottom, let's say 20%, it means you're gonna have to be more creative in the schools that you're looking at. Maybe you focus a little more on the schools that don't use the lottery number. For example, audition schools or schools this year, the schools that um, where they asked for a supplement. So it takes it away from the luck piece. Again, we have no idea how the lottery number is going to be used in the fall. So please, please, please don't devote a ton of energy worrying about it. I'm here, Lisa's here. As we get information, you will know it and Absolutely. we will help you walk through it. Um, but there, it, it, it was definitely an added layer of stress for families. I do think it will be administered better in the fall. I am hopeful about that. 
Um, and that kind of is a good segue to what we don't know is we don't know the post pandemic world. We don't know what the Banks Adams administration is going to do. We, I've seen some sort of hopeful indicators that that make me think that they are going to be more intentional and more transparent about about the admissions process. And that already would be helpful. Um, I also get the feeling that they are not on the face of things against screening mechanisms for high school. And what they're interested in doing is figuring out a way to screen that is also equitable. And that is the real challenge. So I, I am hopeful that this administration will do a slightly better job. At least they are open to the conversation, which I think is promising. The other piece we don't know is we don't know how grades or state test scores are going to be used. I would eat my hat if they ever go back to looking at absences and tardies again. It was sort of a dinosaur of a thing anyway. Um, we'll see. But if it goes back to the way it used to be, it would be the grades from seventh grade. And it would hypothetically be the state test scores from seventh grade. Now, if you just went into a panic because you decided to opt your child out, don't. Because, <laughs> so I'm already seeing a question. So if you opted your child out of the state tests for seventh grade, the way it should work is the schools should just double weight the grades. That's what they do with private school students. That's how it has worked in the past. In order for them to make a change like that, it would be a massive, massive equity issue. And that is not what this administration is about. I can't promise you because every time I think I guess at what the DOE can and cannot do, they do something a little different. But certainly if you feel like your student is not going to perform well on the state test, it is it is, it's not a bad idea to consider opting them out. Is it without risk? No, nothing in this world is, is without risk. Double weight. So uh, you can't hold me to anything specific that I'm saying right now, because this is all guesswork. But right. if let's say a school says, we're going to look at state test scores 50% and we're going to look at grades 50%. We don't even know if they're going to be allowed to do that. But if they did that um, and you're missing that 50%, then they have to double the weight of the grades in order to get to 100%. It's just math. Now, if they keep everything in a batch ranking method, I'm not sure how that's going to work. If they say anyone with threes and fours and on state tests and an 85 and above is all in the same bucket. That's where I get a little squirrely because I'm like, oh, what would the DOE do without those state test scores? Now, I think what they would do is they would treat an opted out public school student like a private school student and say, of course they get a seat and we'll put them in there and we'll just have the grades be worth twice. Um, now let's say you have a student whose grades are not great. Um, that's riskier than to say opt out of the state test because then you would have a double weight of grades that are not that great. So these are all the different things to be thinking about. And um, I hate to say it, but it's kind of too late, right? Because the ELA tests ended today. Um, so whatever you right. do, it will be fine. Um, it really will. There are no bad choices. Like we will all figure this out together. All right, um, school list. Are we on school list? That's a more cheerful topic than lotteries and <laughs> to you. Totally. totally. And I, I don't know how this happens, but it's 721. So um, we have to race through some of this, uh, but we we will absolutely uh, be available, Katie and I, after the webinar, um, both both in the Zoom webinar, but also via email and through office hours. Um, so uh, happy to talk more. But let's let's talk All about. Right. So are you going to make a good school get through list? this in three minutes? All right, let's see. So <laughs> let's do it. Um, the school list. So you're at this stage where like. If I were working with you, I would say, tell me all about your child and I would learn and then I would help generate an over-inclusive list of schools and then you would take that list and go and research, research, research. But what I'm essentially doing is I'm helping you, number one, decide what's important to you. So before you start researching schools or crafting your list, make a list of what's important to your children and your family. This could be anything from a commute to language, to advisories, to out lunch, to uniforms, to community service, lots of different things. 
Um, then you narrow your search. You use your list of priorities to narrow down your search. You notice I'm not say ranking your schools, you're narrowing down your school. Insightschools.org has a really helpful guided search tool that you can use as a starting point. Now it's not as nuanced as say like a human helping you do it, but it's pretty good. Um, be over-inclusive. Your initial list should be over-inclusive. Like when I craft a list for someone, it's got 25 to 30 schools on it, which include a lot of safeties. Try and expand your idea of what defines a good school and make sure that that initial list contains schools that have fewer applicants per seat. And when I say fewer applicants per seat, get ready. What I mean is 10 or fewer applicants per seat. Now, it's harder to fall in love with a school that has 10 or fewer applicants per seat. That's just truth. But they are out there, I promise you. And there's some really great ones. Then you research, research, research. And that's the nice thing about starting now is it doesn't have to be this mad dash. You can kind of do a school every couple of days, have your kids help, look at old videos that exist on the web now because of the pandemic. So research, research, research. Um, if in the fall, you'll go to open houses, hopefully, but before then you're starting to already shrink your list. Um, I like to choose my safety schools first. Uh, it's the hardest part of the process and it's harder to love a school when you're comparing it to your child's top choices. Get the full picture. So don't finalize your list. This wouldn't be happening until late fall anyway, until you have a clear idea of how individual schools will be admitting students. We don't know that yet. That we will probably find out in September, hopefully. And then you will sort of take what you've thought about fit and combine it with what the schools are looking for and make sure there aren't too many schools on your list that really are not practical. Be strategic. So be very intentional when choosing your safety schools. If your child is strong in the arts, maybe consider audition schools. If your child's a strong writer, can consider schools that are asking for a supplement, if that's still a thing. Um, watch out for red flags. So I have a few red flags. So when you're reviewing your school list, do you have too many schools that are six through 12s or K through 12s? Remember a six through 12, you automatically get a seat at that high school. That's great for people who are in that middle school, not so great for people who are trying to get into that high school. Do you have more than eight schools that have many, many applicants per seat? If that happens, then you're getting yourself kind of a little bit into the red zone. Do the majority of your schools have a very high diversity in admission set aside, like over 66% and you are not eligible for those seats? Do the majority of your schools use the same admissions modality? Again, let's see what's happening in the fall, but you want diversity of schools. Finally, and this is the big no-no, does your school look like everybody else's? Because if it does, that is not a list that's focused on fit. Have a conversation with your child about the ranking when you get to that point. They should be owning this process as much as possible, but that's not always realistic depending on the child. So just make sure that they are as invested as they can be. Um, we talked a little bit about, you know, ranking in true order of priorities. So just make sure you're doing that. And then finally, trust your instincts. So these are the kinds of things, a lot of these last tips are things that I would be talking to families about in that sort of November period. So I just want you to have a head start thinking about the kinds of questions you should be asking yourself. Because if you start out with this broad inclusive list that's focused on fit, it's a whole lot easier to add to winnow it down to a list of 12 that's going to be a balanced list than it is to kind of work in the other direction. That wasn't too bad, right, Lisa? I did that like five it minutes. Was great. <laughs> you're, you're amazing. Um, uh, the red flags that you, that, that we just like ran through are, 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 are really important. And what we, what we can do after this webinar is send out an email with, a, um, that has a blog post on the red oh, flags. Yeah, so if, if you weren't able to jot those down quickly, um, cause I think those tips are just so, so important. Um, you know, we'll, we'll make sure you have that information. So I can go through this timeline a bit and give you a chance to, to add some water or, um, or actually I'm, I'm just noticing we have questions too in there um, if you wanna look at those. Um, so uh, here's the timeline, it's spring. Um, basically, if you were taking those, those state tests, 
you should have been preparing for them already, right? So spring semester, which starts in, in January, you should be preparing for those tests. This, the, the tests were today. Um, then math is coming up next month. Um, definitely urge you to prepare for those tests, especially with pandemic learning loss. Um, we also think that it's very important to start SHSAT prep now. Um, it, at least it's very, very important to do your diagnostic testing now to know where you stand versus where you want to be. So it's possible that your child will take a diagnostic test with us and learn, oh, wow, I don't have that much prep to do. Maybe I'll spend you know, a month in the summer and, and the couple months I have in the fall, um, and that'll be enough. But it's also important to know if you if you are trying to get into Stuyvesant or Bronx Science or one of those eight schools, um, if, if that test ends up being harder than you think, again, knowledge is power and it's really important to know you know, net, sooner rather than later, if your if your if your baseline score is far, you know, from from your goal score. So that's what we want you to know ahead of time. And now is a good time to do that. So we talked about researching schools, doing virtual tours, and compiling that initial school list. The really wide, over inclusive, like Katie said, much much bigger than twelve schools. The schools that we're going to learn more about that might be a good fit. Um, in the summer, we're going to want to make sure that kids are doing test prep uh, so and audition prep for the specialized schools and for any other schools that are not specialized that that will you know that take an audition and you're going to want to work more on that school list the summer is a great time to do both of these things because there isn't the pressure of homework of tests of things that that are really you know of, of schoolwork that is also really important so in the summer your test prep your audition prep your school list work um, it's not competing with your schoolwork right so use that time uh, the fall of eighth grade is go 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 so you're signing up and attending open houses and tours whether they're virtual or in, in, in person you're doing a final shazat SHSAT push. Um, normally, the, besides the last two years, the test is given the last weekend of October. So you have September and October to, to, con to continue prep. But again, September and October, the, the test prep is competing with schoolwork, right? And we don't want to let school grades go when, if, if, if we're doing SHSAT homework and feeling very rushed on that. So in the fall, you're also finalizing the school lists and ranking the schools, the one, one through 12, um, and you're submitting that application in December, usually. Um, in the winter, um, there are supplementary applications, which, um, which Katie can go through. There are some schools, um, I think there was a question about that, right? About essays and um, and and things that some of the some of the schools ask for. Um, th those don't come start writing them on. now. Don't don't. <laughs> right. I know some people are like, I want to start the Beacon essay now. The Beacon essay changes year to year, and we right. don't even know if they'll have an essay next year. So please, please, please wait until right. you hear from me or from Lisa or from Beacon. Don't start any other prep except for the admissions right. prep. And I would say that essay writing, um, especially the, the kind of essays that they ask for, um, you, the, the, the child changes enough from being a seventh grader to being an eighth grader that they'll have a slightly more mature voice often and kind of a different outlook on life. Um, you know, it's such a, it's at such a time of growth, middle school for kids that you want this to be their, their eighth grade voice, I think. Um, Great, and then um, usually decisions come out in March, but of course, nothing has been usual <laughs> about the last two years, so we haven't had those decisions yet. And they have started in the last two years, they separated out the SHSAT um, based specialized school decisions from the LaGuardia and general education decisions. So um, this year, for example, we'll find out in April uh, about the SHSAT placements and then not until um, and then not until early June for LaGuardia and the Gen Ed. You always get to wait to decide until you have all your offers in your lap, though. So you don't have to worry about that division, but that is something 
that is something that they started doing a couple of years ago. Um, they haven't figured out a way to make it impactful yet. Right. Um, it's not that complicated. I have some suggestions for them if they would like to ask me. But um, I also wanted to very quickly, there's a couple of questions here that I wanted to answer live. Um, someone had asked about the list of criteria to help inform what's important. It's really things that are important to you as your family. It's I have a very elaborate questionnaire that I use when I, when I ask families, um, but just think about what your child is passionate about, what your family is passionate about and, and use that as a starter for your list. And then there was another question um, that we had that I answered in the chat, but I actually wanna answer it live because it is, it's a really good one and it's one that comes up a lot. If your child is currently at a six through 12 or K through 12, um, the question was, do we need to put that school on the list of 12? And the answer is a great definitely. question. Yes, and even if you're planning on staying at that school and not applying anywhere else, you still have to apply and just put that school down. However, that school can be anywhere on your list. It can be number 12, and you are still guaranteed a seat there if you do not get into schools one through 11. So it works the same way as you know true order of priority. If it's your third choice, put it third. Don't put anything after it because what's the point? You're gonna get matched to that school because you have a guaranteed seat. But let's say you are at, um, just to use an example, my daughter's school, let's say you're at West End Secondary School and you love the school, but you wanna explore Bard and Beacon. So you put Beacon, you put Bard, you put West third. You don't get into Beacon, you don't get into Bard, the seat at West is yours, that's it, you're done. But if you don't put it anywhere on your application, you lose your seat. Don't do that. <laughs> Um, there's a question I think that's more for you, Lisa. Someone is asking if sixth grade is too early to take a diagnostic test. I would say yes, um, um, mostly because you have, uh, the the, uh, the students haven't learned enough of the math that's on the Shazat yet. But would you say, Lisa, that even if it's too early for a diagnostic, it's not too early to start practicing that math, right? Like if they want to get a jump start on it. Absolutely. You know, we 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 say that. Um, uh, test prep um, is directly, you know, or the success of, of standardized tests um, is, is directly correlated to how good of a reader a student is as well. So there are certain things that you can do really early, um, like um, start reading more complex, um, you know, uh, we, we say um, periodicals are great. So um, more complex literature, periodicals, the New Yorker, the Science Times, think about what your, um, what your child is interested in and then try to find things for, him, uh, for, for them to read that are, um, uh, that have, you know, um, uh, tougher vocabulary, you know, and, and um, more complex sentence structure and things like that. So that's a good thing to do to start to prep. And then, of course, we all, we have lots of students every year who want to do enrichment work, which means really, um, you know, getting ahead of the curriculum. So just because in sixth grade you don't know the math yet, if your child is really curious about math and wants to get ahead of the math curriculum, we can um, we can we can always help with that. I don't think that the diagnostic sixth grade is going to, you know, it's it's hard to correlate that to the score that you would get a year later, right? Um, so um, there are things you can do to prep. You don't necessarily need a diagnostic, is what I would say. So what can we do now? Um, well, we just started talking about this, right? <laughs> um, so shoring up those math and ELA skills, which I just talked about, um, reading, learning the rules of grammar, really important. Um, you know, uh, also executive functioning. So um, time management skills, organization skills. And um, Katie, I know this is one that you like to talk about. Um, so I can, I can let you do that, but um, it's something that we both have noticed is, 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 is an issue that more and more kids have, um, especially after these, these two pandemic years, right? Yeah, the executive functioning piece. Like yeah, the exactly. Exactly. It's, I mean, Lisa just, and I just even noticing lot. that just kind of pay attention to your child. Are they having trouble with organizing their work, you know, their schoolwork um, and kind of um, meeting deadlines, 
um, yeah. Uh, kids are struggling more than usual. So already we have the perfect storm, right? Because we have adolescents who are not necessarily strong in executive functioning anyway. They're developing right. skills, yeah, right. but they're not there yet. And they missed a big chunk of school. So all that practice, that low stakes practice they had, like to figure out how to staff without assignments or manage their time, didn't really happen for them. And that's tricky. So, I mean, it's it's not at all uncommon and it's not something to, to worry about on its face. I will yeah. tell you, I, I emptied my daughter's, I have an eighth grader. I emptied her backpack out yesterday because I was like, why does your backpack weigh 70 pounds? It's not safe for you. You weigh <laughs> 70 pounds. And I emptied it out and just it was like, I could see the inside of her brain. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> it was just papers everywhere. Right. And we had a whole talk about how it's really important to keep organized because things may feel easy now, but they won't feel easy in high school. So starting to give them those tools and have those conversations now is essential to a successful start to high school. Um, it's so, whether it's a an executive functioning coach, or just even starting with conversations with you, thinking about like, how long does it take them to do their homework? Why does it take them so long? Are they doing all their assignments at the last minute? Are they not advocating for themselves with their teachers? Like starting to have those conversations is really important. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think focus plays into that also. Um, is the homework being done, you know, while, um, while chatting with somebody online or texting or, um, you know, being on social in some other way. So uh, these are, you know, we, we've all, I think, um, had gotten some bad habits <laughs> uh, during the pandemic um, that, that make it harder to um, then kind of be a really successful seventh, eighth grader and high school student um, later on. Yeah. Um, I think we, we covered all of this uh, briefly. So I'm, I might kind of just race through it. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, here we go. All right. Oh, so, Lisa, can I just say, I want to say one yeah, more yeah. thing, just super quickly, because um, we talked about, we're not going to talk about state tests because, you know, kind of yeah. sure failed. Um, as of yesterday, you're going to talk about audition prep. So just so you mm -hmm. know, for LaGuardia, in terms of getting ready for those auditions, some people will start in the summer. Now, that you can't prepare the audition, but you can start to think about and practice the skills that support that audition. And the DOE and the city actually offer a number of free resources that you can apply for. And some of those deadlines are coming up soon. So go to insideschools.org and look at the free resources. They have a whole list of arts audition, like free arts audition sites, because it's a great thing to take advantage of. And those deadlines are coming up in the next couple of weeks. So I just wanted you to make sure you knew about that before we went on to the SHCT. Great. Um, yes, very important. So I'm going to race through some of this SHSAT stuff and we will follow up with email. And um, like Katie's saying in chat, I'm also available for a consultation so we can work through a lot of this in more detail. But there are important things to understand here that, that we can go through fairly quickly. So um, the SHSAT uh, is a three hour test. It's a very difficult test. It's a very long test. And most students um, find that they have, one of the things that they have trouble with is finishing it on time, right? So you have 114 questions questions, 57 ELA questions, 57 math questions, and um, that's a lot to do in three hours. Um, the test is given usually at the end of October. This year it was December. Last year I think it was January, but we really, we do think that it'll go back to normal, um, you know, once 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 things are back to, uh, to normal in terms of the pandemic. So um, let's see what this next slide is. So, you know, we talked about starting with a diagnostic test in seventh grade, prepping early, reading. Um, these are these are, these are some of the things we mentioned already. And prep can be enrichment. It can be reading. It can be making sure you you've learned grammar. A lot of students um, are not learning grammar in school right now, and that is something that they need to know for the SHSAT. They also have to understand um, uh, how to read and analyze poetry. Uh, so there are things that you can get students accustomed to really early as you know so, um, uh, you know before seventh grade even um, that will make this process a lot less scary and make test prep um, 
much less stressful, right? That's what we want. We want to take the stress out of this process. Um, we always, at Ivy Tutors, we always say that test prep is three things. It's knowing the content really, really well. Um, so that is what we always, will always start with, with your child. The, and then it's strategy. So each test has its strategy. I talked about how one of the strategies is learning to be better at time test. There are strategies for which questions to do first. So the SHSAT has the math and the, um, and the verbal sections, but you can do them in any order. You can do the questions in any order, which is quite unique for a standardized test. So if you are better at math, you're gonna wanna do the math section first. If you're better at ELA, you're gonna wanna start with that because you know that you can really ace that section and then move on to the harder questions. Um, the test also, um, rewards what we call like lopsided genius right so the test <laughs> rewards students who are I love um, that lisa <laughs> yeah, who are better at one at one section or the other really also very very unique um if you you know remember have some memory of taking the sat or the act that that's not the case right so you're so schools are going to want to see really great scores on both sections in order to have a combined really good score here because of the way that um that the test is curved and the way the way that um questions are weighted, um, the more questions in each section that you get right, the more points each question is worth, I guess, is one simple way to, it's a little more complex than that, but that's one simple way of, of, of um, explaining it. So um, there's strategy there too. You know, if you have a, if you have a student who's really wonderful at ELA and has more trouble with math, you know, we might focus on getting every single ELA question right all the time. That's going to be um, more beneficial to that student's score than, you know, um, uh, losing points on the ELA and getting and getting some of those points on the math. So lots of strategy there. Um, that, and lots of things that that um, students have to learn about test prep that are different from the way that they learn in school. For example, you know, with test prep, you have to do math questions as quickly as possible, whereas in a school setting, if you have a regular math test and you don't show your work, in other words, you don't do it as slowly as you know as you need, um, you would lose points for not showing your work. That's typical in a school setting. But in you know what we do is we teach students how to do as little math as possible to get the right answer. So very very different um, strategy. So we have content. We have strategy and then we have practice. The practice component is really important to do with a tutor or a class um, because otherwise you can be practicing making mistakes. So many students will start to download tests and start doing those on their own. And what they're doing is, you know, practicing without knowing the content, without knowing the strategy. So they're just using up test material. Um, that we'd like to give them that test material later once they're fully armed with the content and strategy piece. Um, and then in the, when you're in that um, phase where you're doing lots of practice alongside the tutor, the tutor or the, the teacher for the class is there to look at the questions you're getting wrong and figure out how to not get them wrong in the future, right? So really important third step. And sometimes the, the step that takes the longest, so when you want, because we have all these habits, like showing all the work that we have to break. So we have to constantly be practicing and practicing. Um, really important to know that test prep takes lots of commitment from the child. So we get asked often, what are the factors of success? How many points do your students go up? And, you know, we have students who go up as as much as I think the highest I've seen is like 45%, something like that, 45 to 50%. So huge, huge increases. Um, and then we have students who are equally smart and don't. And the, the difference there is that, you know, with one child, it's their parents who want them to take the test and the other child, they truly, really, really, really want to go to Bronx Science and they can envision themselves there. And they're, you know, um, doing uh, at least 30 minutes of, uh, of homework every night with the SHSAT and really excited about, um, uh, about being a member of that community in the specialized schools and willing to do the work to get there. So that commitment from the child is the most important thing. Um, we, we spoke about this already that we need to aim for 50 points above cutoff. And why is that? 
it's the headache points. <laughs> it, you know, everybody gets nervous on tests. Um, you know, you can um, mess up a question that you usually get right. It, it, things happen, um, but we don't want to get we don't want to let that get in the way of uh, getting into the right school. So let's let's aim for a higher score than the cutoff. The other thing to add to that, Lisa, is what I kept hearing this year from families is, you know, I would say, how did the test go? And they'd say, oh my gosh, my child said the math was like nothing they had never seen, but the ELA was easy or the ELA was really, really hard, but the math, the math was really easy. So there's lots of different versions of the test kicking around and they norm it against each other. That's the good right. news. So that, you know, if everyone's getting the same questions wrong, it kind of disappears. Correct. But you like no matter how much you practice you, there's going to be something that throws you on this test and so you want the space to kind of have take a beat and maybe miss a couple of questions and still um and still be comfortably within the range for the school that you want to be admitted to a hundred percent yeah we also we never know what the cutoffs are going to be it depends on how other students did on the test yeah. so in you know last year we saw kind of record low score cutoffs obviously um you know we can we can only guess that it's it's due to the pandemic learning um but we never we don't know every year the scores are different and it's actually not something the doe releases the cutoff scores they're sort of crowdsourced and um oh, we have them here yeah 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 so these are the crowdsourced cutoff scores um uh Okay. Aim for when you're looking at these, I mean, you don't get too excited by like, let's, let's take, for example, Bronx Science. You see the cutoff score was 20 for, it was 514. This was last year. And right. the year before that it was 535. I would assume we're going to get a bump back to what it used to be. So I generally, when I work with families, even this year, I said, okay, I know you're super excited about that 517, but mm -mm, we're going right. to be aiming for that 532. The 532 plus 50 points. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the headache points. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. Of course, we're, we're, we're over time. I think being 20 minutes over and having answered a lot of the questions, we're doing pretty great. I think we did better than last time. I, and I'm talking yeah. a little scary fast, but not as scary fast as <laughs> I usually talk. Yeah. Do you want to go through your, uh, your final? Yeah, so this is my challenge to say this as quickly as I can. All right. So to put together all the things we talked about today, wide net plus mm. good fit equals less stress. And I really, really mean it. If you start out with that mindset and you focus on fit and you think about all the different ways and different kinds of schools you can apply to, the process can be, dare I say it, a little fun, like a little tiny bit. Like, I know that seems crazy, but I have seen it happen. And I have worked with people for whom it actually- It is was, like, fun to fun. discover all these schools. Yeah. And you know- Not you all might fun, be, but there are fun yeah. parts. <laughs> I, I think the discovery portion and, and kind of figuring out what schools are might be good for you, reading about the schools together with your child, that can be quite exciting. Especially if you start from that fit place. So it's like, oh, you're yeah. super excited to because to go to a school that has an environmental club and a soccer team and Mandarin. And you're like, oh, wait, this school has all three of that. You know, it's exciting. Um, all right, next, don't focus on college. What I mean by that is the number of people who say, I want to go to a school that's going to get my child to good college. It's not how it works, not how college <laughs> works anymore. Um, no. Yes, you can look at X missions to get a sense of like student body and, you know, what's happening in a school, but that data lags by four years. So a lot of schools that may not have great X missions are already tremendously better schools, but that's reflected in their freshman class, not their senior class. So just bear in mind. The other piece of that is colleges want students who are not just doing school. They want college, they want students who are passionate about school, who are excited, who have some sort of trajectory in their learning. And the schools that do that best are the schools that really see your child, not the ones that are necessarily like checking a box. This is the most competitive. It's the school that really fits your child the most. Uh, the unique school list is important, not like your friends. Um, you can fall in like with the school, but don't fall in love. Very few seats at a lot of these schools. 
don't believe everything you hear. I am here as a resource, as is Lisa. Feel free to throw it our way. If you hear something that seems crazy, it's probably wrong. Um, and also <laughs> people will say things about schools, you know. Good life advice in general, right? <laughs> like, exactly. <laughs> yeah. People will say things about schools and inside schools or something in the comments. Right. And it will seem comments. really ranty. If it seems really ranty, <laughs> it's probably ranty, right? Take it with a grain of salt. Right. Um, and when you start to visit these schools, don't lose sight of the fact that, that while these schools are choosing your child, you are also choosing them. Yeah. And ask questions that are pertinent to your child's needs. Now, I mean this even more for my amazing kids with IEPs. Ask those questions. A lot of the information on how they support students with IEPs is not all over the website you need to ask very smart and very pointed questions. And if you don't get a response, that is an indicator of how that school deals with students with IEPs. So mm. this, and this is something I talk to a lot of families about. There's you know, some really good lists of questions to ask, but remember that you, know, you lose sight of the fact that you're also choosing them and your child is choosing them. So don't be afraid to ask those important questions. Yep, yep. Absolutely. Well, Katie, it's always so amazing to have these conversations with you. You are just such a wealth of information and you make it really digestible and easy to follow and easy to understand. So we're, we're really lucky to have you as a partner. Um, Katie and I are going to be launching some a kind of a special partnership for Ivy Tutors Network where um, we're going to do uh, some office hours uh, that that are included in the cost of tutoring. Um, uh, we'll do that, you know, uh, biweekly, so uh, twice a month um, and um, some, you know, look for that and other exciting things from us. Um, I know we're we're really over time. Are there if if there if people want to answer uh, to ask one or two more questions, we can stick around. Is there anything unanswered here? Let's see. Look. Oh, um, when are? Oh, you got it. When are Lacardia <laughs> editions? I mean, okay. who knows? But late. You know, they're they're in fall. They're usually late fall. But right. that, that was when we were in the live editions. Um, I know that they did callbacks live this year so as i said they are kind of moving back towards that model a little bit um but i i i, I don't know I, I really don't know how that's going to work in the fall i hope that they figure that out before the fall that would be the goal right open houses. So this is a good question lisa hmm. open houses again <laughs> historically i promised you'd hear that word from me a lot historically yeah. open houses are in the fall um dating from usually beginning of October all the way through sometimes to January, um, depending on the school, depending on the timeline. Um, we'll have to see what's happening with COVID. The great thing is there are tons of um, recorded Zoom open houses and tours. It's not the same thing as seeing the inside of a school, but you can it's start to start. Right. And you can weed through schools. So there may be a school yeah. that you're like, probably not, but maybe, maybe that's a school you do like a Zoom, you do a Zoom tour this summer and you just watch the recording and that helps you decide whether you want to visit it in the fall or not. So use it as a, as a resource. Yeah, definitely a good, a good summer activity to look at those recorded tours and yeah. yeah. Someone is asking you the ones for LaGuardia, I assume you mean tours and open houses are tours, in the, yeah. the only tours that used to happen, and this was like three, two, three years ago in the spring were Bronx Science and Bard Queens. And I really don't see that happening this spring. Um, I'd be very surprised. The rest of them, including LaGuardia, all happened in the fall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Let's see. All right, we're getting some thank yous. Thank you guys for being here. And, um, and thank you. For Lisa. those of you who stuck around. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, did I interrupt you? No, I just didn't thank you, Lisa, for hosting. It's always okay. so fun to do with you. Of course. Yeah, it is fun. Um, for those of you who stuck around to, to screenshot this, <laughs> do it now. Uh, this is a great slide. Resources. Um, and while you're doing that, I'll answer a couple of questions that I'm seeing pop. So the Zoom okay. tours are on the actual school websites. So welcome to like the inside of a public school brain. Every website is different. Um, you go on, 
you find the tab that says admissions and there will usually be some sort of recorded element. Sometimes it's not in an obvious place. You kind of have to dig, but in doing that, you are exploring the inside of the brain of the public school that you might be interested in. So, but it may take a couple of minutes. Um, someone was asking about whether Nest has its own application process. Again, it depends on what time, what day you asked me that. Um, uh, they do not have a test like they used to, um, but they were supposed to just be part of this batch ranked lottery this year. But then in the very, very late part of the process, they asked for um, some essays. So they actually had grades that sort of grade slash lottery piece be part of their rubric and the other part was this essay. So it's no guarantee that it's done that way in the fall, but I, the one thing I can say is it is not, like I think you're probably thinking of it being a gifted and talented or a citywide school. Um, they don't have their own test. Uh, the only school that has its own test is Bard Queens and Bard Manhattan. And even that goes through the standard gen ed process. Great, I'm glad we, we, we mentioned that. That's a question I get a lot. All right, well, thank you again. Thank you, thank you everyone for being here and we'll follow up with you so you know how to get in contact with us and um, uh, hopefully we'll see, you, we'll see you soon. Bye, thank you so much for coming. Bye, Thanks, Lisa. Katie, bye.